what are my favorite supplements right now? How do you increase your VO2 max? And many other questions in this Q and episode. So if you want to ask me a question, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamlund. All right, first question, your favorite supplement stack at the moment. So obviously I'm not going to go into full detail with all the supplements in this video. You can check out my previous videos about it. I'm just going to run you through like the supplements that I am most interested in right now. And I think that are most effective. So number one is obviously going to be glycine. Number two, NAC. You can look at the video about the glyneck combo that I made before. It's going to increase glutathione. Number three is going to be collagen peptides. Number four is going to be astaxanthin that I previously mentioned. So astaxanthin, you know, it has benefits for lipid profile, blood pressure, and those kind of things. But the biggest thing that I'm curious again is about the skin benefits. So it's going to protect your skin against UV radiation. And I think that is probably the, you know, most important benefit of uh, astaxanthin. Number five is omega-3s. Number six is going to be hyaluronic acid. There's been a few uh, clinical trials in humans as well showing that hyaluronic acid increases skin hydration, improves wrinkles, elasticity, and those kind of things. Number seven is magnesium. So recently I started to take more magnesium again because of the effect it has on phosphorus. So I don't have any like sleep problems. I don't have any stress problems, which you would you know usually use magnesium for. But uh, what I noticed is that my phosphorus was going to start to increase slightly and high phosphorus status is associated with uh, worse kidney health. And uh, kidneys are something that, you know, will decline with age. So I don't want to, you know, mess up my kidneys before I'm like 80 or 90 or 90 years old. <laughs> so r r balancing your phosphorus with magnesium is going to help you maintain better kidney health and actually what they find is that the high phosphorus intake and high phosphorus levels are associated with worse kidney uh, function and uh, kidney failure only in the absence of magnesium. So magnesium is kind of something that kind of counterbalances the phosphorus. So I've had, uh, I have added like more magnesium to my routine as well as of now and it did lower my uh, phosphorus status uh, as well. And last, number eight is going to be TMG, trimethylglycine. So it's a methyl donor primarily, but it also has uh, many studies indicating that it has exercise performance benefits and muscle strength benefits. So I do think that it's uh, one of those supplements that is worthwhile to take. Of course, there are some other supplements on the list that could have like quite an interesting research and uh, like, you know, cost to benefit ratio, like creatine monohydrate. It's very cheap. It's very safe for most people. And it has a lot of benefits for the brain and muscle strength as well. I'm just not like, you know, super excited about it because, you know, there's already, it's it's so old, we already know creatine works, there's so much data, we don't need more data to get us excited about creatine, like we already know that it's super powerful, but the rest of the supplements I'm still, you know, pretty interested and excited about. I haven't recently shared my updated supplement routine as well, but do know that the amount of supplements I take is uh, much lower than it was uh, before. So I've cut down my supplements to maybe, you know, 10 supplements. So the ones that I mentioned in this list, uh, pretty much. Next question, not able to increase my VO2 max training the 4x4x4, four by four by four. still no gain. Guide me, please. So first, it would be pretty important to know if your VO2 max isn't increasing. <laughs> so like, did you measure your VO2 max before and after? You know, what was the difference? Has it stayed the same? Has it declined? Has it increased, so to say? So that is a quite important thing. So VO2 max isn't something that you can just, you know, measure at home with uh, like a blood pressure measuring device or even it's it takes more effort and it's harder to find than just taking your blood test as well. So you do need, you know, ideally you would want to get the spirometry uh, at a sports lab that, uh, you know, directly measures your VO2 max. That's the most accurate way to know your VO2 max. There are like some sport watches as well that are like pretty close. They're not probably like 100%, but they are a good estimate. But uh, without any tech, you can also know your VO2 max by doing the Cooper test. So that's the run as far as possible within 12 minutes test. So we did it in high school, uh, in middle school as well. We hated it. It was like super super annoying test, super hard test as well, because you pretty much have to run as fast as possible for 12 minutes to go, go the furthest, furthest distance. And uh, if you get your Cooper test, so if you run 2,700 meters, so 2.7 kilometers within 12 minutes, which is around 1.7 miles, then uh, that means your VO2 max is uh, 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is the lowest mortality risk. And that's what you ideally want to get to if you you and then you can like okay 
you can see, okay, I'm able to run faster with the Cooper test, I'm able to go further with the distance within 12 minutes, then that means your VO2 max is generally increasing. So you can use uh, that. So yeah, but the first thing is to know, like, are you measuring your VO2 max? <laughs> because many people aren't, you know, measuring it uh, on a regular basis. So let's say that you are measuring it, you're in a plateau, you're stuck. Right now you're doing the 4x4x4 four by four by four routine. So you're doing four minutes of a high intensity sprint followed by four minutes of uh, low intensity or walking and then repeat it for four rounds. So it's like a 32 to 35 minute workout. That is the most effective way to increase um, VO2 max with interval training. So they have done meta-analysis in the past where they compare short intervals. So 30 seconds, less than one minute and less rounds as well and shorter duration in terms of how how many weeks you do that versus long intervals so over four minutes over you know five six seven minutes and that kind of thing even and they find that longer intervals more rounds and the longer duration increases vo2 max more than the shorter intervals so you know some people might not respond to a particular interval training you know about 40 percent of people don't respond to zone 2 cardio in respect to like their vo2 max so you might need to just change it up you know like people have different physiologies they have different let's say genetic predispositions or genetic strengths so it might be that the 4x4x4 four by four by four might not be the most optimal method for you or the other thing is that you haven't done it for long enough <laughs> so in the in the meta-analysis they find that even doing four to twelve weeks of the long intervals is what works so you might have to do it for 12 weeks even every week you know once a week at least that's what i do the four by four uh, i do once a week of this and it has increased my year to max you know i'm gonna see if it keeps on giving me gains but you know you might have to do 12 weeks of this program <laughs> or you can also you know, try to add more zone 2 cardio because your VO2 max, yes, the interval training increases the peak of your VO2 max, like the actual, you know, the going in the pain cave, so to say, it's going to increase the, that threshold. But in order to have good cardiorespiratory fitness, you need to have a very good base, like a very good foundation, which, which in uh, endurance is called like having a good solid base, very large base. And that is trained with low intensity interval training, like low intensity exercise, not interval training. So zone two cardio, 60 to 70% of your maximum heart rate. So it's very low heart rate, low intensity. You can do it while breathing through the nose. And this is what lays the foundation, lays a bigger base to your pyramid in terms of your VO2 max. Whereas the interval training gives you like a bigger peak. So if you have a low base, you have low zone two output or low two zone two uh, performance then uh, you need to work on that so ideally you want to do both you know low, uh, zone two cardio and the interval training as well if you're only doing interval training then you're not going you're not going to build the base that much so you need to kind of find a balance and you know for the record most of the pro athletes the people with the highest vo2 max in the world cross-country skiers and pro cyclists they do a lot of their training on most of the training in zone two. They do like 80 to 90% of their training in zone two. So, uh, you know, goes to show uh, what the pros are doing. <laughs> so they are not doing a lot of intervals. People who do intervals usually do it for the time efficiency, which uh, is true. Interval training is more time efficient. But if you're not doing any zone two either, then you're missing out or you're leaving gains on the table, in my opinion, and based on the research. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake and cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. Next question, how many hours per week should I do for HIT? 
So this is actually, you know, kind of ties into the previous question, how much hit should you do then? You know, there is no single answer to it. The general answer is that the more hit you do, the longer intervals, the more rounds, the longer in terms of uh, the duration in weeks, the higher your VO2 max is generally going to be with some like nuances there. But generally, the more cardio you do, both zone two and the hit, the higher your VO2 max is generally going to be. But then you have to realize, okay, what's the optimal for longevity purposes as well? Because with exercise, there is a slight J-shaped association with mortality or U-shaped curve as well. So low exercise or no exercise as all, at all is associated with increased risk, but too much exercise is also associated with slightly increased risk. And uh, the optimal is somewhere in the middle, you know, moderate amounts or just the right amount, which, you know, obviously is going to vary between people and uh, varied between their fitness status. The fitter you are, the more exercise you can do without causing harm and etc. But we do have a recent 2023 meta-analysis or like a systematic review as well of the training protocols for the lowest risk of mortality and lowest risk of heart disease by James O'Keefe and others. It found that the more moderate physical activity you do, the lower your risk of all-cause mortality. For all-cause mortality, vigorous physical activity reached its most benefits at 650 minutes per week, providing 17% reduction. But moderate physical activity kept giving benefits up to 900 minutes per week with a 35% risk reduction. When it came to cardiovascular disease mortality, there was a similar trend. Doing 900 minutes per week of moderate physical activity yielded a 40% risk reduction. For vigorous physical activity, the benefits were maximized at 150 to 200 minutes per week, giving a 15% risk reduction. After that, there was a reduction in benefits, so this kind of J-shaped curve. Like I said, there's obviously going to be some nuances and individual differences, but the takeaway for me, at least based on this large systematic review of you know multiple studies is that doing more high intensity training isn't going to give you more health benefits and it's not going to reduce your risk of mortality and heart disease you know the more high intensity training you do but the the opposite is the case with moderate intensity exercise so the more moderate intensity exercise you do the lower your risk the lower your risk of all cause mortality and the lower your risk of cardiovascular disease mortality as well. So I have switched my training focus to, you know, getting the optimal dose for the high intensity training and then trying to really maximize and doing a lot more of the moderate intensity training. So I'm going to be doing around 150 to 200 minutes per week of uh, both resistance training and high intensity training combined because that's what categorized as vigorous physical activity so you know anything above zone two is going to be vigorous physical activity so lifting weights hit cardio those kind of things those are categorized into vigorous exercise group and moderate intensity activity are zone two cardio zone one which is walking speed walking hiking gardening walking you know anything else that keeps you in the fat burning zone kind of in the 60 below the 60 to 70 percent of your maximum heart rate that's the moderate uh, physical activity and you want to do that you know up to a thousand minutes per week and it's gonna be still uh, better for you than doing a thousand minutes of high intensity training if that makes if that makes sense so i'm aiming for you know 150 to 200 minutes per week of high intensity training so in practice for me it looks like i'm lifting weights three times per week 45 minutes each workout and I'm, then I'm doing the 4x4 four four hit to workout as well once a week, uh, which is 32 to 35 minutes. So in total, I'll be getting the 150 to 200 minutes per week of uh, high intensity or this vigorous uh, physical activity. And I think that, you know, you could ideal, you can definitely play around with it slightly. Um, you can do less weights, you can do more hit intervals, but most people don't need to do any more than one hit workout per week. Like it, there's just based on the data more isn't better and uh, there is a sweet spot where too much actually starts to give um, diminishing returns so to say next question what's the best fat ratio so best fat ratio you know um, it's hard to give an answer because there haven't been like that many studies looking at all the fat ratios and uh, linking that to longevity or reduced all cause mortality there are a few of the fatty acids that we can like, okay, we can anchor our diet around these uh, ratios. And obviously the biggest, most commonly known uh, ratio is the omega-6 
to 3 ratio, so having too high omega-6s in relation to omega-3s uh, is bad for, you know, like uh, inflammation status, cardiovascular disease risk, and all-cause mortality. So the higher your omega-6 to 3 ratio, then the higher the risk generally is. Uh, Hunter-gatherer societies, they have a ratio of less than 4 to 1, whereas in modern industrialized societies, the ratio can be up to 20 to 1 or 50 to 1, so like 20 times more omega-6 omega fatty acids um, in the blood than the omega-3s. So ideally, you want to be at least below 4 to 1. And personally, I would say that, you know, 3 to 1 or 2 to 1 is probably 3 to 1, uh, is the kind of the optimal for the maximum risk reduction. And I did, you, and this is something that you can measure, you know, you can do the, the test that measures your omega-3 index plus the omega-6 to 3 ratio. And, uh, you know, I recently did the test. I got a result of 2.7 to 1. So that's below 3, which is the good spot, a good range. And then you can also measure the omega-3 index. So the amount of omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA in your red blood cells. So the higher the amount, the, or at least based on the data, then having your omega-3 index around 8% and above is associated with lower risk of mortality, heart disease and uh, neurodegeneration, dementia, Alzheimer's, compared to having your omega-3 index below 4%. Uh, so, you know, the more of like the higher the index then you know there's no data that having an index of 12 percent is better than eight percent so you at least want to be eight percent my results were nine percent i'm going to try to get it to ten percent maybe eleven percent we'll see it's going to just take a lot of uh time the uh red blood cell turnover rate is like six months so it takes you know it's going to take at least a year to significantly change your omega-3 index uh, but yeah, like, you know, I'm ideally going to get to 10 to 11% uh, for the maximum risk uh, reduction and the greatest association with longevity. When it comes to total fat intake, then there are some um, epidemiological studies. The Pure study they did find from 18 countries around the world, the lowest mortality was seen at a fat intake of 35.3%, with an intake of 10% being linked to higher risk of mortality. So I think that a uh, general fat intake around 35% uh, is probably, you know, healthy is probably the best. You don't want to have too low if you have like, there are like uh, some uh, groups of people in the Southeast Asia region. Uh, those people generally have like a very low fat intake, like 10%, but there are like some genetic reasons as well why uh, they can like thrive with that. Most people probably do better on a slightly moderate fat intake. So like 25 to 35%. If it goes more than that, 40, 50, 60 percent, you know, there's no long-term data about the ketogenic diet and mortality, and there's not a lot of people doing it uh, either compared to the general population. But I think if you look at, okay, what are the other macros that I keep, have to keep in mind? So like with protein, you want to get at least like 25 percent of your calories, 20 to 25 percent of your calories as protein, then you get... 35% of your calories as fat, something like that, and the rest of them from carbs. So with uh, respect to carbohydrate intake, then the lowest mortality is found with a carbohydrate intake around like 45 to 55%. So yeah, like that kind of fits perfectly. So like 25% or 30% at the most with protein, 35% fat, and then 45, 50% uh, carbohydrates. Next question, best macros for muscle growth. So actually, this is very uh, ties in with the previous question again. So like I said, you have to first figure out the protein intake, which uh, the maximum benefits for muscle growth are. They have found that you don't see additional muscle growth benefits from eating above 0 0.8 grams per pound of uh, lean body mass of protein per day, which is 1.6 grams per kilogram. So that's lean body mass. So that's slightly lower than your total uh, body mass. So like depends on your your body composition status. So you don't see any additional benefits going above that, which, you know, for most people, for me, that 0 0.8 grams per pound of lean body mass is going to be something around 100 to 120 grams of protein per day. And uh, you don't need to eat more than that. Like a good, easy rule of thumb is that, okay, I'm going to just eat 0 0.8 grams per pound of total body mass, which is fine, 
uh, it's not going to be any harmful. You're just not going to see like maximum muscle growth benefits and you might, you know, sacrifice some calories from carbohydrates, which would actually give you like a, you know, bigger boost for muscle growth as long as the protein intake is uh, kept the same. So, you know, your protein intake for most people is going to be something like, again, 25 to 30 percent of their total calories. When it comes to fat intake, then for normal physiological functioning, it is recommended to get at least 15% of your total calories uh, from fat, which for most people is going to be around like 30 to 50 grams at the minimum of uh, total fat per day. But uh, men who have a fat intake of 20% appear to have lower testosterone than men who eat uh, like 40% of their total calories uh, from fat you don't see additional testosterone increasing benefits beyond 40% of your total calorie intake. So somewhere between 20 to 40% is the fat optimal ratio for muscle growth uh, because you know testosterone does have a like a positive effect on muscle growth as well. And if you do want to maximize muscle growth, then yeah, like something like 35% again with the fat, like we talked previously, or up to 40%, you don't see any additional benefits beyond 40%. So, you know, 30 to 40 percent of your total calories from fat and then the rest which you know if you look at your protein 25 to 30 percent uh fat 30 to 40 percent and then like again like 40 to 50 percent of then the calories the remaining calories should come from carbohydrates people who eat the most carbs generally have you know at least like bodybuilders and uh, professional athletes uh high carb athletes dominate the sports uh industry there, you know, there are like some low carb athletes as well. You can, you can easily build muscle with low carb, but what are the best macros? What are the optimal macros? Then it is like, you know, at least 40 to 50% of the calories as carbohydrates. That's, I think, you know, makes sense from the math uh, side as well. All right, next question. Is there a limit to calorie restriction we shouldn't go beyond for fat loss? So there's a lot of uh, things that determine that how much fat the person has to lose how long have they been dieting? How long do you want to diet? What's your you know, medical history? And what can, what's your preference as well? Because there are diets that can be shorter, but they're more aggressive in terms of the calorie restriction. And there are also diets that are less aggressive. You, you know, lo- notice less the calorie restriction, but they also take a lot longer time to achieve the goal. So these things all play into the you know how much calorie restriction should you follow for uh, weight loss one thing is for sure like the most important part of sustainable weight loss isn't like how fast you lose it it's keeping it off and uh, if you do follow a diet plan that okay makes you lose a lot of weight very fast like you can literally eat just like you know celery sticks for a week and you'll lose a lot of weight but chances are you're gonna regain because eventually you have to eat and if you don't have you know you don't have the good habits related to food intake and satiety signaling then you're probably just going to regain the weight because you're going to overeat the calories and uh, you know when you look at the studies about the biggest loser participants those people they went all in with extreme dieting extreme calorie restriction and extreme exercise for a few weeks and then after that they regained most of the weight and they actually were in a worse spot than they started from because their muscle mass was lower their metabolic rate was lower as well later so you don't want to crash diet is the i guess the key insight here like what is the most amount of calories i can eat to still lose weight is a much better way of uh, thinking about it because if your metabolic rate is super high let's say your metabolic rate is 5000 calories then it's very easy to lose weight because unless you're eating literally like ben and jerry's and fries and mcdonald's <laughs> then it's going to be very hard from with whole foods to reach 5000 calories per day unless you don't literally have any self control at all and you're like just binging so if you have a very high metabolic rate then it's much easier to lose weight and trying to eat as much as many calories as you can while still losing weight is a more sustainable approach in my opinion rather than trying to reduce the calorie intake as low as possible without going crazy with the hunger (laughs) if that makes sense this requires obviously just paying attention to your weight and uh, paying attention to your food intake but in the long term it is a more sustainable approach and it also avoids this uh, 
inevitable decline in your metabolic rate that occurs uh, with dieting. It doesn't matter what diet you are, if you lose weight, your metabolic rate is generally going to decrease slightly because, first of all, you lose weight, you lose both fat and muscle, so your resting metabolic rate is going to be lower and therefore your body burns less calories. You can also, obviously, you can like control that with the macros, you can control that with exercise, but that's the general trend. Your resting metabolic rate is going to decrease no matter the diet, if that makes sense unless you build muscle with it, which you know, is, is of course uh, possible. But uh, what most of the sustainable diets recommend is that you know, like 20% is the general recommendation for calorie restriction per day. So 20% less calories per day. You don't need to count your calories. If you do, then that would be like more effective way of approaching it. But 20% is the general like safe uh, maximum limit for sustainable and you know relatively quick uh, weight loss as well. You can also just do different types of dieting, like you can do the fasting mimicking diet or the alternate day fasting where you eat like 500 calories on one day, the next day you eat normal calories, 500 calories the next day, and then you cycle uh, for a few uh, weeks. You know, there's many ways to skin a cat. You can be 100% calorie deficit for one day, so that will be 24 hour fast, 48 hour fast, and then eat normally the rest of the week. So for the entire week, you have a pretty steep uh, calorie deficit. So what matters more is the total calorie deficit over the course of weeks and months, rather than just the day deficit. Uh, like the 20% per day recommendation is just a good estimate or like a, is a generally good um, like an um, anchor to uh, look at when it comes to how how big of a calorie deficit is sustainable over the long term. If your calorie deficit goes, you know, 40%, 50%, then you're not going to be able to sustain it for much, like very long. You might be able to do it for a week, but after that, you first of all, you're going to lose a lot more muscle by being in a very steep calorie deficit. And then the hunger signals will also kind of kick in. Usually, for most people, they if you get like a 50% calorie deficit, then yeah, like they're not going to be able to sustain it any longer than like one to two weeks, uh, probably. Next question, when is your new book ready? So my next book, The Longevity Leap, is going to come out in a few weeks. I don't have a specific date yet. Depends on when you are watching this video as well. <laughs> as of now, uh, the end of March 2024, it's going to come out in May, probably. So you can, if you're watching it from the future, <laughs> then you can search it on Amazon, The Longevity Leap. If you're watching it right now in March or April, then uh, you can join the uh, waiting list as well at thelongevityleap.com. You'll get a bonus chapter after the book has launched. And uh, it's just going to give you some more insights into my own uh, personal routine for you know, optimizing longevity and uh, health. Next question, is all your Instagram content on YouTube as well? Uh, no, so I do post a lot of the shorts from my YouTube to my Instagram. So it's actually very funny because my YouTube, you know, I have obviously a lot of subscribers, a lot of people watching my videos, but YouTube almost has like a different ecosystem between long form videos, which is like this one, and my other like five, any any video that is longer than one minute <laughs> is in the long form category. And then you have the YouTube shorts, which are the less than 60 seconds uh, vertical format like you have in Instagram. So they're almost like two different ecosystems. I have a lot of, and the people who watch the shorts might not always watch the long form videos and vice versa. <laughs> so if you are watching the, right now, the long form video, then I don't even know if you have seen like a lot of my shorts. You probably have seen some of them, but they are they are like slightly two different ecosystems, which is like unfortunate. Like ideally, I would want everyone to watch both <laughs> of the videos, like watch the shorts because the shorts are different content slightly. They're more bite-sized format, like short. I'm just going to tell you like these bullet points, blah, blah, blah. Uh, very like one individual focused uh, topics. Whereas with these longer format videos, you know, I might blabber for tens minutes <laughs> in a row. But yeah, I do post the shorts to my Instagram as well. Not all of them. Uh, if you want to see all the short format videos I do, then the YouTube shorts will have all of the shorts. On Instagram, maybe like 80 to 
90% of the shorts will be on Instagram because on Instagram, I also post a lot of other content. I post uh, like text-based content, uh, those kind of things, uh, other images, infographs, those kind of things on Instagram. So Instagram has a lot of other content than my YouTube channel. So you definitely want to follow me on both of the channels. You want to follow me on YouTube and Instagram. And I also have a Twitter where I post, you know, actually unique content as well that doesn't make it to Instagram. Some of the Twitter posts go to Instagram as well, but not all of them. So if you want to get all the unique information from different <laughs> uh, platforms, then you want to follow me on all the different platforms. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube being uh, three of the main ones. Next question, best way to detox after exposure to smoke from fires, both breathing in and through skin? I'm actually pretty glad that you asked this question. It's, um, I think, a very uh, underrated topic. You know, we are not, not just firefighters and construction workers and not just like military personnel. You know, every, every regular person as well is exposed to air pollution, these uh, forever chemicals, microplastics, heavy metals from our environment as a default almost. If you are living in a like urban setting or close to a large population center, then you are exposed to different kinds of heavy metals and chemicals that you ideally want to you know, detox is the wrong word, like I don't like the word detox uh, as well, but you can excrete them for sure. Number one, sweating, uh, so your body excretes microplastics, heavy metals, different other chemicals uh, from uh, through your sweat as well. So taking a sauna regularly, not only it's not only good for your heart health, but also good for the kind of, <laughs> not the detox health, but just the eliminating these different chemicals and toxins from your body and there are a lot of the studies on this have have been done on like gulf war uh, veterans or these um, veterans who were previously in a conflict zone or something where they burnt tires and got exposed to different chemicals and stuff like that they do find that uh, yes the people are able to excrete uh, these uh, toxins and chemicals through the sweat Bloodletting is another recent thing I stumbled upon. So firefighters, they did a study on firefighters and uh, bloodletting reduced the amount of these PFAS, these forever, forever chemicals from the blood of these uh, firefighters. So sweating, regular blood donation. So like, the thing with blood donation is obviously that <laughs> if you donate the blood, you have a lot of microplastics and chemicals in your blood and you donate to someone else, then you're doing them a disservice. So, you know, ideally you want to donate blood but not donate it to anyone <laughs> because if you have a lot of uh, chemicals in your blood, then you know you don't want to give it to them. So yeah, fi finding out ways. This should be like some sort of a biohacking clinic where you do bloodletting uh, without <laughs> donating it to someone else, just to lower the burden of microplastics and uh, these forever chemicals uh, from your uh, system. Next question: What's your skincare routine? So uh, this is something that I have started to focus a little bit more over the last year or so. Previously, I didn't have any skincare routine <laughs> at all. Um, and the reason is because there is quite compelling research about the link between your skin health and uh, skin aging with health outcomes and longevity. So just having better skin health and uh, less wrinkles, less pigmentation, those kind of things is just a sign of slower biological aging and it's a sign of biological youth. So... Um, you know, if you have better skin, then it's going to be predictive of better health outcomes in the future as well. So I have started to pay attention a little bit more to this. And, uh, you know, there are some of the basics that I do, like I don't eat like a super processed diet. I get moderate amounts of sunlight. I mean, I live in Estonia, so there's very little sunlight <laughs> as of that. Uh, so I'm not getting like super high amounts of sunlight exposure because UV radiation is the number one extrinsic factor that accelerates skin aging. So if I were to live somewhere like Australia, where there's literally like ozone layer very close to the place, then I would use like sunscreen. Here in Estonia, I don't need to. Even in the summer, it's uh, pretty low uh, UV radiation. But uh, yeah, making sure that you don't get exposed to excessive amounts of sunlight. Then things like saunas, I think are pretty beneficial as well for cleaning the pores and uh, improving circulation to the skin so that's going to help um, and but it does dehydrate your skin as well so you might get like some uh, let's say temporary uh, wrinkles because your skin is dehydrated so if you do a lot of sauna if you do a lot of exercise you don't drink that much water uh, then your skin might look more wrinkled <laughs> because it's uh, dehydrated 
Uh, those are the kind of basics that I do. And sleep as well, obviously. In terms of supplementation, then there are actually quite a few supplements that can help with uh, skin and changing and the ones that I use as well. So obviously collagen that I mentioned, collagen peptides. I take 10 grams of collagen peptides every day for the last uh, two years almost. And uh, yes, they do work. There's a lot of randomized control trials in humans showing that they work. I've noticed that it works on me as well. Second supplement, you know, glycine. There's, there was one question from the Q&A that does glycine have skin anti-aging benefits as well? I haven't seen direct studies with glycine on skin anti-aging per se, but because glycine supports collagen turnover a lot, like it's the primary amino acid in collagen turnover, then I would imagine that it does have skin anti-aging benefits as well. So I'm taking like, you know, 10 grams of glycine every day as well, uh, just for the other health benefits, like the lower inflammation, uh, lower homocysteine, and uh, regulation of autophagy and you know maybe other uh, glutathione, creatine synthesis, those kind of things. So I'm taking 10 grams of glycine for many other reasons. Um, next, there is uh, the supplement of astaxanthin that I mentioned again. I mean, it has like lipid benefits, blood pressure benefits, but yeah, the biggest reason I'm taking it is because of the protection against UV radiation and uh, meta-analysis of randomized control trials showing that uh, it does reduce uh, skin aging skin aging and uh, reduces wrinkles and fine lines uh, as well so that's a good supplement to take and lastly is uh, hyaluronic acid which is also shown in human trials to uh, help hydration actually so the hyaluronic acid refers to like the hydration of the of the skin so uh, yeah you lose it with age similar to collagen so yeah I'm taking the hyaluronic acid as well which I think has pretty good uh, evidence and that's in terms of the supplementation, when it comes to skincare products, I don't use like a lot. I don't use like sunscreen regularly, like I said, because there, <laughs> there's not a lot of sun here. Uh, but I do use uh, the Aletura skincare, uh, let's say, serums. They have a very nice uh, serum, the gold serum. It's got CoQ10, astaxanthin, olive oil, uh, collagen peptides, marine collagen, uh, as well as this uh, copper peptide which is an actual peptide that uh, helps with uh, triggering collagen synthesis in the skin. So that's the main serum uh, that I use. And uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. And the last question is, is the fluoride on matcha or green tea potent or not too concerning? <laughs> this is a little bit of an interesting question. I guess what you're referring to is, is fluoride from green tea and matcha bad for your health, similar to uh, fluoride from like tap water. So there is some association between uh, fluoride consumption from tap water and like lower IQs. You know, there's obviously an, an amount that is optimal. If you're drinking a lot of tap water that has fluoride, then you are getting too much fluoride. <laughs> uh, the, the amount of fluoride you get from coffee, tea, some other foods is very small it's very hard to meet the recommended daily allowance for fluoride from just eating whole foods or drinking coffee or drinking tea. So you're not really getting anything that would be harmful uh, for your health or your cognition <laughs> uh, from in respect to like the fluoride from uh, green tea or uh, foods. So that's uh, kind of safe from that. Even like toothpaste, the amount of fluoride you absorb from toothpaste that has fluoride is very small, like you literally absorb like 0 0.1 milligrams per brush per uh, every time you brush uh, your teeth. So, uh, you know, you don't have to be worried about fluoride in your toothpaste um, either, unless you're swallowing the toothpaste. If you're literally like swallowing the toothpaste, then yeah, you're absorbing more. <laughs> so like, you know, most people don't uh, swallow. So children might swallow the toothpaste because it might taste good. So, you know, children are yeah, very vulnerable to excess fluoride. Uh, so for them, I wouldn't yeah, suggest, I don't think it's good for their IQs and intelligence to drink tap water and, and uh, you know, use fluoride uh, toothpaste. For the adults, you know, yeah, you don't want to drink fluoride tap water because tap water is also filled with other, you know, it has microplastics as well. <laughs> so just uh, don't drink tap water, use a filter. Berkeley or some other like this uh, aqua pure uh, filters, reverse osmosis filter, just filter out the water from other uh, compounds that you don't want to drink and uh, it's going to reduce the fluoride there as well. 
but yeah, like you don't have to worry about fluoride from foods. Yeah, and the toothpaste as well is something you know, I, I don't really worry about it. Like it's only 0 0.1 milligram and it's not enough to exceed the RDA, which if I'm not mistaken is like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 uh, milligrams of fluoride uh, per day. All right, that's it for this Q&A. Make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seemlon for future Q&As. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Stay optimized, stay empowered.